folks and friends, we are here with uh, Justin, uh, the mastermind behind Crippled Black Phoenix. And this brings me to the first question. Crippled Black Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix is something rising from the ashes and makes it makes, like, glowing and, and rebuilt and you are crippled in black. Why? Uh, well, you know, it's like without the light there's, there's no dark, without the dark there's no light. Death, life, the death of something immortal. Uh, you know, something that's ultimately victorious. All those different connotations, you know. But uh, it was just like a, the, the first time, it was just a play of words. And that's all yeah. it was okay. at, at first. And then it took on more meaning. And then weirdly, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, the band name became more meaningful with different things that happened to us in the band along the way. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit strange. It's like, um, I mean, it's, it's like you release a ton of stuff since your uh, foundation in 2004, yeah. I guess, yeah. 2004. Uh, almost one release every year. Oh, yeah, almost. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, not almost. Like, um, I count I it as 1.3 releases a year. <laughs> well, that's, that's so, more than one, one, one release a, a year. You know uh, more than I do, though. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I did the math. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, how do we achieve uh, to, to make it this uh, in this continuity? Like, um, you never, in my opinion, you, ne you never released a shitty album. Uh, well, you know, that's down to the, to the listener to decide that, but um, I don't know, I mean, I never really questioned it. It's just a matter of, you feel like doing something, you feel like making some music, you make it. You know, the biggest motivation, well, one of the biggest motivations for me is, it, when I want to hear some music and it doesn't exist, I make it myself. And that's what motivates it, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I never, I never question it. It's just you know, you, you you feel like doing something, you do it. I mean, there might come a time where it's like five years and I don't want to do anything. But you know, who knows? It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't yeah. happened yet, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe it's like um, because you have a lot of lineup changes and a lot of different people joining the band, and leaving the band, and, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, this is the inspiration. No, that's that's just a, a symptom of a, a weird kind of band setup. I mean, there's a big, massive, big list of musicians that, according to Wikipedia, are ex-members, and but most of them are not even. They weren't members. They were people who either they guest they did a, a guest part on an album, or they they filled in for somebody on tour, or okay. you know. So the, the there's not actually so many members as what people think. But you know, I mean, it's a large band. I mean, because I, I, we believe in that every part we do on stage is played by a human. <laughs> so we don't have you know backing tracks. We don't have any, any sequences or anything like that. Everything's played. So it requires you know eight people, man. You know, we've had cellos on stage. We've had violins. We've had two drummers. You know, so it's uh, it's. It doesn't really ring true, you know, that's not how many people have been through the band. But I mean, we've been pretty stable. I mean, at the moment, there's like three core members of the band, and it has been like that okay. for for quite a long time now. Is you know, Mark, the, the keyboard player, Mark, mm -hmm. and Daniel, the singer, and myself, and we we basically make up the core of the band. Um, and then the only way we can really tour is the Everyone else in the band, you know, everyone's equal, you know, everyone's a band member, a family member. But there's so many people with so many other um, commitments. Um, it's impossible for us to ever tour if we, if we had to stay all the time with the same people. So everybody's free to not be able to tour. You know, stay yeah, for instance, yeah. this tour, Ben just couldn't get the time off work. You know, and he's still in the band, he's still our live drummer, you know, and he has been for a very long time. Um, but because he couldn't make this tour and it was in a Poland tour, he was like, okay, we'll find someone to tour and we, we found Gaspar and, and that's how it works. <laughs> okay. So, there you go. So, like, <laughs> you don't uh, ask yourself when you're writing songs, it's not like, oh, how do I bring that on stage? You just write the songs mm -hmm. and afterwards you say, oh, how I realized that that, <laughs> that could be different uh, or yeah. difficult. Yeah, 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 it's definitely like, always the album comes first, the songs come first. Um, and then we avoid playing them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we basically stick to our strengths when we when we play live. We've been more adventurous in recent years. We've started to play songs where we think, okay, you know, there's some songs um, such as Rain Black, Rain Heavy off the new album. And they're the kind of songs where you could play it note perfect. Everybody in the band could play it note perfect, but for some reason it'll sound like shit. You know, uh, it's just they're, they're fragile songs. It's weird. So I think it was a lack of confidence on my part that I, I avoided. You know, I, I avoided playing the songs like Bust on Blues or Operation Mince Me. You know, because they're ballads and they have strings on the recording and you have the production and you have the atmosphere. It's very difficult to reproduce that in a live setting, especially on our level where we're playing club venues, where we don't have a big production, you know. Uh, so maybe one day when we have the money to do that, we can produce these songs again live, you know. This brings me to the... Originally I wanted to ask you this as the last question, but uh, you gave me a hint um, and now you play on Summer Breeze. Mm -hmm. This is a huge, huge production festival. Right. This is like massive. You ever, ever been there? No. no. Huge, gigantic. Uh -huh. It's like um, it's like Hellfest kind of thing. Yeah, the third, third big. Uh -huh. Ah, don't. Wacken and. Don't, yeah, Wacken and then something between and then some uh -huh. Okay. And it's massively big. Right. It make quite melancholic music. Um, that made me think and relax and I put on the vinyls and, and just lay down and enjoy. Um, but Summer Breeze is all about partying people yeah. and drinking and booze. Yeah. Uh, how do you think you fit in this? I don't think we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we get booked to play these things and I appreciate it, you know. Um, I've never really thought we were a festival band. Uh, some festivals we like, we seem to go down good, like Say for instance, Hertzberg Festival, which is kind of more kind of like rootsy, and and we we had a really good slot, you know. After the sun went down, and it was Perfect. very atmospheric, yeah, yeah. Very, and we got to play a long set. And those kind of setups seem to work for us, you know. I mean, I don't. We played Hellfest, and I don't know if I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that really did us. Any good at all? I don't. You know, I, it was I don't like I don't we just show. But then we play a uh, Euroblast and Hammer of Doom, and they were great. And we went into it thinking, why are we playing this? You know, so it was a fifty-fifty chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but it's great being. We're lucky, really, uh, because we seem to be able to play very different kind of festivals and shows with very different kind of bands. You know, heavy heavy bands on one side. You know. And, blues and folk bands on the other side, you know, it's, it's, we're really lucky to be able to do that. But then the only downside to that is we never really know how it's going to work, you know. We'll see. I wish you the best of luck with, with some of these because it's an amazing festival. I've been there last year and it's uh, huge, it's really huge. Uh -huh. uh, you play on the main stage? I have no idea. Yeah? <laughs> no, I don't okay. know. Do you know them? No. Convince the people to play on the camel stage. Camel stage is... Camel stage, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. For you, it will fit just perfectly. With a huge tent uh, uh -huh. above and okay. some cry. You also release a lot of vinyl stuff. Mm. Uh, and um, as for me, I'm a huge vinyl collector. And I have quite a lot of Cripple by Phoenix vinyls. Because um, I don't know if you know Dova Beverly of uh, Insect... Oh yeah, the drummer. Yeah, the drummer, yeah. 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 Uh, he once posted um, Hold On on mm -hmm. his Facebook page oh, okay. and wrote something like uh, Who don't like this song has no heart. <laughs> and I was like, oh, let's find out if I have a heart. Okay. And I listened to it and I was like, wow, well, okay, where can I get the record? <laughs> and then I uh, bought all of your records and, and it was like, a huge fan. Oh, <laughs> As okay, I okay. told you, I'm, I'm a oh, fanboy. Nice. Yeah. I'm a fanboy, <laughs> fuck you! Uh, so it's thanks to Dober. Yeah, thanks to <laughs> <laughs> Hey Dober! <laughs> so, um, how important is it for you to release all the stuff on vinyl or do you just don't care if it's a CD downloads? Oh, no, it's, or... it's super important to be on vinyl. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I want everything to be on vinyl. I mean, that's just from a fan point of view. You know, I, I love vinyl myself, you know, I'm very much old school like that. Um, and then I never fell out of love with it and 
I don't. I really don't like all the 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 modern kind of streaming downloads yeah, yeah. and all that kind of thing. Yeah. It's you know, it's quite insulting sometimes. You know, when you put in so much love and effort and time and money into something, and then it just gets squished and in, into little tiny files that don't even exist. Exactly. And float around in in the internet. You know. It's like like people uh, come on with their iPods or or iPhones and say, yeah, I have uh, fifty thousand songs mm. on. Yeah, but can you tell me which songs? Are... No, it's yeah. like tr I like track eight. Yeah. Well, I used to I used to um, be like a music tutor for, for children, and they were kind of uh, you know young teenagers, and they would they would uh, literally they have so many songs on their phone, and they wouldn't be able to tell you what the song's called. They wouldn't know who the artists are. They just know the song and they just play it. You know, say okay, what what song do you want to what do you want to play today? You know, because it's all about making bands, you know, teaching kids how to be in a band. You yeah. Know? And you'd ask them to make a cover version of a song, and then just say, "Yeah, this song. Who's that? I don't know." Oh. You know, and their attention span is so short because the next week it, it would be, they wouldn't even remember what they did the week oh. before. It's it's become really disposable. I mean, I'm, that's an extreme example, of course, but even within you know the the rock band community, you know, everybody's everybody's streaming and just going and so it's like. There's too much music, so people don't cherish it so much. It is, you know, everyone's to themselves. You know, I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone for the way they listen to music, but when when you when you buy something, when you go into a record shop, for instance, and you see something and you buy it because the cover looks amazing, and you take a chance, you know, it might be crap, but if it's good, you really sort of treasure that, you know. And you've spent your money, and you've spent your money on something that you keep, and you can. You know, the, yeah, whole, I, the I, whole experience is it like enriching. It. It's not, you know, you can spend your money and pay your subscriptions, and what do you get? You know, you get to listen to a few songs, and you don't really you care know. about that. Yeah, I mean, there's people who still care about it and they still use Spotify or whatever, and they still listen to the albums. But I think, as a general, big white world kind of point of view, the big shift to that is really kind of starting to destroy some of the really nice things about music and bands, you know. Like the story of buying records. I bet you have a huge vinyl collection at home and when I come at your home and uh, put out some LP, I don't know, I just choose one, you can tell me a story like, ah, yeah, I bought this, that, that, I had that experience yeah. with it. Yeah. And this is for me. When you come at my home, I can my my whole um, vinyl shelf is full of stories, like not only the music, but how yeah. I bought it, how we are listening to it, and I think that's most important. Yeah, I mean, you might not even like some stuff you burn your yeah. but it's like you know, it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. A, it's like a bad tattoo, you know. I mean, no, I've got enough. <laughs> you know, I've got enough of the records in my collection. It's like I still have them, and think, why the hell have I got that? But it re represents a time and a place. You've got a story, a memory. You know, it's like writing songs that I don't like anymore, you know, I stand by everything because it represents a time and a place and yeah. uh, you have a memory of it, you know, so. Definitely. You know. But that's, I think that's what's yeah. lacking in it, and the tension span and the awareness, there's just, there's just too much all of the time for, for basically no, you know, it's like no value. You know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, my last question, and this is a tough one, uh, it's a theoretical. Very, very theoretical. Uh, what would happen if you release or record the perfect album? Like, you say, okay, I can't do any better. The press is like, okay, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Very theoretical. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Would you keep on making music? Would you shift to make other music? Or would you say, okay, that's it. I reached everything. I I think no, I'm the, the only I'm, playing live. Uh, I mean, if I, if I, if that ever happened, the only way to go from there would be backwards. That's where I'd go. <laughs> Start again. <laughs> Not just go backwards. I don't know. I mean, well, I'd get worse. <laughs> <laughs> you reach your point of perfection. The only way to go forward is to get worse, right? Right. <laughs> so that's what I'll do. I'll get worse. I ask a lot 
a lot of people, I asked a lot of people this question, but I mean, this was the nearly perfect answer. Everyone was like, I don't know, I just keep on doing music. <laughs> but to get, a, get worse, yeah. this is perfection. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's the honest answer, I guess. You know? yeah. I mean, God forbid, I would ever make the perfect album. I hope I'll never do that. Yeah, because then you reach this level of no. Yeah, I mean, it's not possible. I don't think anyway. <coughs> no, it's not. So possible. I mean, but in theory, you know, it'd be like, yeah, what's what would be the point in continuing after that? You know, so you're always striving for, for perfection, but perfection doesn't always mean technically perfect. It could mean the, the atmosphere or the style or the mood or yeah. anything and, yeah. and the slight shift in that could also be, you know, really good but in a different way. But no, nah, I mean without getting all pretentious and theoretical about it, no. Nah. It just I just I never want to make the perfect album. I just want to keep plodding on, you know. Uh, the the one thing about not having really high goals and expectations and striving for perfection is that you will last it longer, I think. This is my kind yeah. of personal inner thought theory. <laughs> you know, because I think too much emphasis now on bands, they have to make the best album and it's the first album and it's everyone's favourite band and they're overhyped and then it's gone. So, you know, I mean Call me old fashioned, but back in the day, you know, when the, the old guys who were running the record labels and the record companies who didn't know anything about music, they were just like businessmen. Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa made a very good point about this, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. I know, this interview. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. Yeah, but the point is that um, bands were allowed to develop. They could do what they wanted and they developed. So, I mean, you look, I know it is an obvious example, but if you take Pink Floyd, for instance, you know, they went through many different phases and ideas, and some worked and some didn't, until they got to what well, I would say obscure by clouds and metal and like that. And then it was, that area was for me was perfection. But the point is that before they got the, the Pink Floyd sound, they went through many different developments yeah. and experimentation and everything else. And they were allowed to do that. You know? And people were into it. People liked different parts of it. And it was all very creative, very productive, you know, constructive kind of experimentation. I don't just don't think that exists, but it exists. But say, for instance, if we're following that formula, it's never going to make us successful. We're always going to be at a certain level because I don't think it's commercial anymore. But but uh, listen, when I listen to your music, I clearly hear the Pink Floyd references in, in some parts, some little parts. Yeah, it's I mean, like it's, it's, but it's in equal measure to lots of other different influences. I mean, not even film. I mean, not even old music, not film, life. You know, there's lots of different influences. Pink Floyd one, people pick it out, I think, because it's quite a strong, strong identity. You know, it's easy to say, oh yeah, okay, Pink Floyd. Oh, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't deny it at all. But it's all, it's all out of respect. But it's, just it's not, it's not about the music, but the sound of the guitar. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's like this uh, Pink Floydish yeah. sound. But it, never shy away from a good idea. Yeah. You know, if you're in the studio and you. you pick up the guitar and do some kind of riff or solo or melody or whatever and it's the sound and somebody says, oh that's too Pink Floyd or it's too su such and such, oh. you think, yeah but it, it sounds good, right? Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. Okay, okay, deal. Deal, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Yeah. So, our questions. Uh, well, thank you a lot for this little interview. Cool, I was less disappointed. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> Totally not. <laughs> it's, no, we have this. We just have a running gag. Uh, a running gag. Yeah, it's not terrible. Okay, tell, tell the viewers about the running gag. All right, comes, was it from the last tour? I think so. Yeah. We just yeah, we were just everything was less dis. If it was good, if it was really good, it was, it was less disappointing. Less disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then it, okay. That's then the, it was that's, less disappointing. That, that's the CBP way. 
<laughs> no, it's ne we're never overexcited. <laughs> <laughs> That's why crooked and black. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Phoenix is so wonderful and positive and, and always rises, but it's our, our Phoenix is always somehow crippled and disadvantaged. But, so um, there's always there's always a cloud to a silver lining. <laughs> Perfect end words. So uh, thank you for watching and thanks to Mr. Reeves, uh, Justin, and see you soon.